Thank you, Karen and Lucy. Uh, I'm really deeply indebted to you both for the opportunity to be here tonight. First of all, I consider myself to be one of the luckiest people on the face of the planet. And why? Because I've had the good fortune to work with school librarians in Florida and here in South Carolina. Where's my South Carolina groupies? Okay. And lucky because I recently had the chance to work with some fantastic gentlemen whose dedication made this, this graphic novel possible. More about that in a moment. What do you know about the Holocaust? Where did you learn it? Do you know why the Nazis considered Jews to be an inferior race? How did this happen? How could this have happened? Are we watching it happen again? These are just some of the questions that I want young people to consider. Who bears the responsibility? Who is responsible for educating and informing young people about the Holocaust? For the survivors, they've been telling their stories for years. And for the survivors' families, they also carry the torch. And what about librarians? Of course, you have a role here too. But there is a problem. Holocaust ignorance. Previous surveys have proven it. And it was really brought home recently when a Virginia junior high school student write, writing in a widely distributed commentary, she wrote that her Holocaust education consisted of one slide with a brief description of concentration camps and a worksheet. She concluded, no wonder Holocaust education is so lacking. Felix Goldberg, and Bluma Tischgarden. They were not so different than young people today. He played soccer, she skied in the winter, both kept up with their Jewish studies, their families worked hard in the small towns they grew up in. Little could they have imagined how their lives were about to be turned upside down. There is an image in our book. The Nazis had just burned the home where 13-year-old Bluma Tischgarden lived and her family are seen running, escaping from the fire to survive. When I first saw that image months ago, I could not help but think about the news I was seeing, we were seeing daily on television, the pictures of the millions of Ukrainians running from their homes, trying to save their lives. I wonder if today's students will make those connections, that hatred, anti-Semitism, Prejudice, discrimination, genocide, and war are simply, not simply things that happened in the past. Of course, anti-Semitism didn't just begin with World War II, and our book dives into those roots. It started with words. That's an awareness campaign that began last year by the Claims Conference. I'd like to borrow it for a few minutes. 77 years ago, 77 years after World War II ended, we're still reading and learning about the war, its impact, its victims and stories, many of them buried. The moment, I believe, could not be more appropriate for this book. Despite efforts by TikTok and Twitter and Facebook, Holocaust denial continues. It's clear that many young people are oblivious to what the Holocaust was and what happened. Keeping stories like the Goldbergs alive is more important than ever. I have a story for you. 22 years ago, Felix Goldberg, of blessed memory, handed me the speech that he had just delivered at our synagogue, not far from where we're standing. The occasion was Yom HaShoah, the Daniel, annual day of remembrance, well, he had just testified about his harrowing Holocaust experience. As he stepped off that stage, he handed me his speech and said in the most beautiful Polish accent, Frankie, do something with this. He knew I was an education consultant. His words changed my life. Now, I'd known the Goldbergs all my life, but it wasn't until that day when he charged me with passing on his story that I realized how powerful and important that moment was. It started with words. They are, after all, the backbone of reading and literacy. 
Here we are at the Anne Frank Center, which celebrates the life and words of perhaps the most famous victim of the Holocaust. Words are also ways of influencing and persuading, as Adolf Hitler and the Nazis did when they proclaimed the destruction of the Jewish race, which they repeated often, as they attempted to annihilate the Jewish population. Six million gone, but many survived to retell those stories so we would never forget. The Goldberg story had been told previously in newspaper accounts and videotaped testimonies in person. They spoke to schools and civic groups. Now their children continue to tell the story to keep those memories alive. So what could I do with Mr. Goldberg's story? His story, along with that of his wife, Bluma, first resulted in a website, storiesofsurvival.org an education resource that details their journey from war-torn Poland to Columbia, South Carolina, both miraculous survivors of the Holocaust. The family was instrumental in endorsing it and providing resources. As I began to think about the design of this resource, I decided that their story would be told in three parts, before the war, during the war, and after the war. It includes a historical timeline and maps, recommended readings, other primary sources. I've already heard from educators who find it valuable. So how do we teach and reach young people today? I believe we had better embrace and use the media that they attend to. Recently, the grandson of a Holocaust survivor interviewed his grandmother and uploaded it to TikTok, where it received millions of page views. How is that for building awareness? Graphic novels, as you all know, have reinvigorated young people's literacy habits. On my bookshelf, The Diary of Anne Frank, George Takai's They Called Us Enemy, and the late Congressman John Lewis's best-selling March series, as well as many others. You all know these appeal and engage young people. Knowing their popularity, that's when I again approached the family who agreed that a graphic novel was another opportunity to tell their parents' story, to educate the next generation. And even though the story had been told previously, this is the first time it's been told like this. Writing this book was truly a collaborative effort, thanks to the family and my writing partners. I'm reminding of a recent quote attributed to filmmaker Francis Ford Coppola, who said, every time he makes a movie, he gives it everything he's got. Well, that describes my effort here, too. So the Goldberg family asked me recently, Frank, how do we know the graphic novel will be used? Well, here in South Carolina, teaching the Holocaust is mandated by the legislature. We see our book as a unique resource, a one-of-a-kind graphic novel for educators here and elsewhere. And I can announce here tonight, we are putting the finishing touches on a teacher guide with lesson plans and activities, and we'll be sharing that information on our book's website and Facebook page. So now, there's some very important people that I need to recognize. First, let me ask the members of the Goldberg family who are here to be recognized. Esther Greenberg, Esther, would you raise your hand so everybody can see you? And her brother, Henry Goldberg. Henry, raise your hand. Their brother, Carl, was away. If it had not, this could not have been possible without their blessing and cooperation. In media literacy education, I'm fond of saying students only know what they see on the screen. They rarely learn how a production gets to the screen. Well, the same can be said for a graphic novel. Young people probably don't appreciate the work that goes on behind the scenes. So my next recognition is for my good friend, illustrator Tim Oakline. Tim, would you raise your hand? But I gotta tell you, this young man is much more than an artist. He's a fact checker. He's a researcher. Thank you again for your dedication. Uh, my editor, John Shableski, could not be here tonight. He texted me and said, it's killing me not to be here. But he's juggling five other books. But my publisher, Steve Wilson of Imagine and Wonder is. Steve, would you raise your hand? Thank you, Steve, for going to press early so that each one of you could get a copy of the book. And I would be remiss if I did not thank my wife, Melanie, who has stood by during this process. Now, she did not want me to say this, but she had a birthday yesterday. I'll pay for that later. 
During your conference, you have an opportunity to learn more about the evolution of the graphic novel when we present on Thursday afternoon at one in the afternoon. I hope to see you there. As always, school librarians, you are the backbone to literacy, reading, knowledge, and so much more. Thank you for what you do. I salute you. It's an honor and privilege to be with you. We'll be inside after dinner to give you a book and to autograph it if you'd like to. Thank you very much.